Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Joyce, and I am an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Coral Springs group, and I'm here tonight because I know I'm only one drink away from a drunk. And I really want to thank the committee for inviting me to share my experience, strength, and hope with you this evening. It's a great, great honor for me, and I am truly, truly humbled. And I want to thank Dawn. Thank you very much for all the goodies that were up in my room with all the literature And I want to thank Cookie and the program committee for asking me to share tonight. And uh, I also want to thank my sponsees that are here tonight and all of their sponsees and all of their sponsees. (laughs) And I am truly grateful. I'm a great grand sponsor. And, uh, And I really believe in sponsorship and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor couldn't attend tonight because she had a little accident, but she will be here during the week. I do have a sponsor, and she has, <laughs> and she has 46 years of sobriety in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I told you I'm a member of the Coral Springs group, and they just celebrated 37 years as a group last July. And my sobriety date is August 7th, 1977, and I just celebrated my 31 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I have been a member of that group for 31 years. And the reason that our group is 37 years old is because we follow the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous in our group. And we meet every Monday night at 7 o'clock at a beginner's meeting and every Thursday night at 7 o'clock for a book study meeting and 8.30 for a book discussion meeting, so uh, for a regular discussion meeting. And if any of you are in Coral Springs, please come over. We would love to see you. I want to tell you, I've been very busy this week. I got a pe- And you ladies will know what I'm talking about. I got a pedicure. I got a manicure. <laughs> My hair is still the same color it was as when I came into the program. (laughs) I walk every day. I pray. I meditate every single day of my life. I diet when I can. (laughs) I go to meetings. I sponsor girls. I babysit when I can. I go out with the girls. And I don't know about you, but when I first came into the program, I said to myself, what am I going to do for the rest of my life if I stop drinking? And also, you know the story. You know, uh, they tell you how you get to be an old-timer in AA. You don't drink and you don't die. And here I am. I also remember, and it was like it was yesterday to me, I can remember when I came into my home group and there was a lady there, and I said to her, I will never get up there and tell my story (laughs) because I didn't trust anybody, you know, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, We are taught in AA to tell you what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And uh, I can tell you that I come from a small town in uh, western Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a real tiny town, and I'm going to tell you the name of the town. It's Jeanette, PA, because usually someone comes up after the meeting and says, oh, I know where Jeanette is, and then we strike up a conversation. So that's all very, very nice for me. Um, I came from a family that uh, didn't have much money. I felt very insecure, had low self-esteem, but so did everybody else in the town. We were all alike. (laughs) And there was a lot of drinking in my family. And my uh, my dad worked in a factory, and uh, I had a kind and loving family, but, like, they drank a lot. Uh, My father, uh, he lived till he was 96 years old, 
And uh, I had gone back every year to visit him uh, when I came into the program. And I said to him, and he drank a six-pack of beer every day of his life. I mean, uh, that was a minimum amount. And uh, he had gone into the hospital, and I was talking to my mother, and I said, Mom, I says, you know, uh, how's Dad's drinking doing? She says, well, the last time he came out of the hospital, he says he forgot all about it. So that's how I know the disease of alcoholism centers in the mind rather than in the body. Uh, my mother was a very, very spiritual, was a very, very spiritual woman, and if I could have anybody else's spirituality, I would want to have hers. Uh, in growing up, um, my dad, he belonged to the Elks Club, and he belonged to the Moose and the Eagles, <laughs> the Garbaldi Hall, the Polish Club, the American Legion, and if he didn't belong to it, he knew somebody that did. And I can remember in growing up, um, I liked going to the parties at Christmas time because what they would do at the parties, that, and you know, we came from a budget, you know, where we got our clothes from the Salvation Army when it wasn't fashionable to do so like we do today when we go to Sally's. And I remember I got a little dress every year, and I would go to the Christmas party, and I would love that. They would have the band, and everybody would be drinking, and Santa Claus would come, and they would give us popcorn balls and, and uh, give us a little basket, and I loved all of that. And uh, I can remember we would go across the street to Big John's, and that's when they served 10-cent beers. So that's a long time ago. I'm really, you know, telling my age here. And they had the 10-cent beers, and, and the guys would uh, drink out in the one bar, and the woman would be in there the, in the other part of the uh, Big John's, and the kids would run all around the place, and we'd have pop, and we'd have potato chips. And I just loved all that. I loved the bar scene from a very, very early age, except for one thing, that when I came home, there would be a lot of fighting. And I didn't like the fighting. And I remember when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, you said you put your head under the covers and said you, when you grew up that you were never going to drink again, uh, like they did in, in their homes. And that's what I said. I put my head under the covers and I said, when I grow up, I'm never going to drink like that. Uh, as I went along in school, I, was, uh, I went to Catholic school. Uh, I had a lot of fear in my heart. Uh, and it talks in the big book about that fear, that evil and corroding thread, the fabric of our existence. And I was fearful all of my life. Uh, I was fearful even when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And that fear, I would used to hide behind the couch when anyone would come to the house. And I was fearful of going to school. And I was very, very shy. And I couldn't predict what was going to happen in my family when I uh, went home. I didn't know if they were going to be happy or if there was going to be a fight or whatever. And I would go to church and I would pray. And I was always asking for a vision. Please come down. I had The nuns used to tell me the story about the Lady of Fatima. And they would tell me, you know, that, uh, that she came down and visited the little children. And I would say, oh, please, you know, please, Blessed Mother, come down and talk to me. In all the statues, I was always looking for something spiritual in my life. And the statues were like cold. They did not, nobody was listening to me. I would go home, and my mother, uh, as a result of my shyness and hiding, uh, she decided that she would send me to dancing school. So uh, they uh, cleaned the dancing school, you know, for, to pay for my lessons to go to dancing school. And I loved that. You know, I became Jeanette's little song and dance darling. I had that egomaniac with the inferiority complex. And it was really sad because, you know, when my dad would build the little sets for the dancing school and everything, but I was always scared because I never knew how he was going to show up, if he was going to be drunk or if he was going to be sober. And so... Um, but I loved all of that, and I can remember that I started drinking around the house a little bit. And I remember one time, you know, I would drink the ends of the, the glasses that they would leave, leave around. Gosh, that made me feel good. And uh, someone gave my dad a bottle of Manischewitz wine, and he opened it up and had one drink, and my mother put it in the cupboard, and I discovered that Manischewitz wine, and I drank that wine. I loved that feeling. 
I used to lay on the bed. Do you ever remember that? You put your hand on the floor. The room would go round and round. And I loved that feeling. And I drank that whole bottle of wine. And boy, did my dad get it from my mother. <laughs> and she says, you drank that whole bottle of wine? He says, no, I didn't. But he couldn't remember if he did or he didn't not anyway. <laughs> And that was my first sneaking around with drinking and my denial of, you know, what I was doing. I went to high school, and as a result of my, you know, dancing school abilities, uh, I joined the drama club, and uh, I was a cheerleader, and uh, I can remember being out in the football field with a bottle of Coca-Cola filled with, uh, with some kind of whiskey or something or another, drinking it down, you know, and everybody was out there. I had a great capacity for booze. I could drink the guys under the table, and I thought that was my forte in life. <laughs> and I remember I could get served, you young people that are out there, I could get served real early too. And I would go into the bars, and I loved the bars, and I would sit on, a, I sit up at the bar, I would cross my legs, I would light up a cigarette, you know, because I'd seen all those movies, and I'd blow the smoke, <laughs> and I loved to get out on the floor, and I liked to dance. And then I'd go in the ladies' room, I'd get sick. <laughs> and I'd come out, and I'd dance all over again. I loved all that. Um, as a result of doing some drama uh, uh, stuff in, in high school, I was offered a scholarship to the Pittsburgh Playhouse School of the Theater. And uh, it was a two-year free uh, scholarship, so that was good because my parents, I really wanted to go to college, but my parents couldn't afford it. So I went to, uh, to the Pittsburgh Playhouse, and now, you know, we were kind of like on a beer budget, you know, where I came from. When I got to the Pittsburgh Playhouse, I was introduced to different drinks, and uh, I liked all that. They had the hors d'oeuvres. I didn't know anything about hors d'oeuvres, but, you know, I learned real fast, you know, about the scotch and, and all of the other things that you, you learn, and uh, I still had that inferiority complex, and... Um, I left the Playhouse, and I got a job in a children's theater company, and uh, sure enough, this guy comes to the children's theater company, and he was from Texas, and uh, he met me, and he said he fell in love with me at first sight. Now, it took me a little bit of time, but I can remember, you know, he said that he fell into the wrong crowd when he met me. <laughs> And I was, uh, I can remember having my first martini. Oh, I felt that going down. I loved that feeling. And when he was going with me, one night I drank 13 martinis. <laughs> and I knew, uh, because they were all counting them at the bar. <laughs> and I had a great forte for liquor, but I'm going to tell you, I wasn't doing too good that night. <laughs> and he was trying to make out with me, and he couldn't. <laughs> And I said to myself, well, I'm never going to drink 13 martinis again. <laughs> but I never said that I wasn't going to have any martinis again. And so we uh, did uh, children's theater. We got, uh, he went and uh, he was a stage manager at the Summer Stock Theater. And I went there. And uh, we kind of courted one another while we were in the, in the Summer Stock. And we decided to get married and move to New York City. And my husband had, now, this is, this is really crazy because he had a big jar full of dimes. And he had $500 in dimes, and that's how we got married. And we got on the Greyhound bus, and we went to New York City, and we lived in the three-room flat on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in Little Italy. And it was right off the Bowery, so I think I should have, you know, noticed something as we were uh, there. But we had these signs all around us, and uh, I immediately had two children. And I was really scared because I was a party girl, and I didn't know how to take care of children. And I can remember that John would hold me at night, and I would say, I am so scared because uh, I had all this responsibility, and I didn't know how to handle it. And um, 
we kind of gave up the theater at that point because we had responsibilities in our life. And uh, he got a job at Newsweek magazine, and he wasn't really making that much money there. And then he decided to go, and I looked in the paper, and I said, why don't you be this computer programmer, whatever it was. And this was before computers were ever, you know, out or anything like that. So that's what he did. But he got this job at night helping out with the finances. And he says, Joyce, he called me on the phone. He says, I don't know what they're doing here at this job. But he says, they seem like they're serving drinks up on the third floor. And it wasn't until he came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that we found out that he was working at Towns Hospital where Bill had his profound spiritual experience. So there were signs all around us. Um, my drinking during that period of time was he would go down to the Bowery and get some quarts of beer, you know, in the containers when he would come home at night, and we were pretty much on a, uh, on a beer budget. Uh, as he came to be a programmer, a computer programmer, he started making more money. We moved up to the Upper West Side of Manhattan off of Central Park West. We had a railroad flat, and we paid $57 a month. We were uh, living high off the hog. We were drinking uh, drinks before dinner, wine during dinner, drinks after dinner, going over to the park for the symphonies, going to Sardi's for lunch, that grandiose behavior that I have noticed that alcoholics experience when they're drinking, and I have even experienced when I'm not drinking. <laughs> And so that's what we did. We lived there, and before you know it, we had two more children. I had waited, we waited eight more years, and we had two more children. And um, I don't know, I noticed a little bit at that time that, you know, when someone would deliver a package or something, I started to shake a little bit, and I couldn't sign the thing there. And then, then I would go into the supermarket, and that's when we wrote checks in the supermarket, and I was practicing before I went out to to sign the checks before. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that or not, but I was, uh, I was showing the signs of alcoholism. And what I'm trying to tell you and share with you tonight is the progression and the downward spiral of the disease of alcoholism. And also I will share with you as we go along the progression of recovery in, Alco uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I was getting a little bit shaky, and then before you know it, they were going to tear down the apartment where we lived, and we had to move, and so we moved to New Jersey, uh, Teaneck, New Jersey. Now, when we got to Teaneck, New Jersey, I was the bored housewife, believe me, and he was going into Manhattan, and he would go into Manhattan on the bus. Now, he was a regular at the briefcase pub at Port Authority. And he'd go in there and he'd have a couple of drinks, and that's when the days when they were having the martini lunches. And he would go in there and he would work, and then he would come home, and he would have his drinks, and I would be drinking at home, and I would tell him on the phone, I'm so scared. He says, have a drink, it'll be good, you know, for you. And, of course, that's all I needed to hear because he wanted to drink where he was. And so he'd get on the bus, and sometimes he'd make it to where we lived, and sometimes he'd end up in Hackensack at the, at the bus barn. And he'd call me up and says, i got to get a cab home from where I am because he'd fall asleep on the bus. And the fighting started, and we started fighting with one another. And I was getting, uh, I, oh, I'll tell you, I was just deteriorating, and it, just, just terrible at that particular time. And one time he called me up and he says, can I come home? And I said, what do you mean, can you come home? And it seemed like he'd been gone for three days, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> crazy in our house, crazy in our house. I remember there was a guy down the street, he was running for office, and he asked me to be his campaign manager. <laughs> I said, sure, I'll be your campaign manager. My goodness, he won. <laughs> Guess what? They asked me to run, too. I won. I'm telling you. And then they started delivering all of these uh, pamphlets and leaflets. And, oh, that was too much for me. I had to give it up. But that just goes to show you all the potential we lose, you know, from our drinking. One day, I couldn't come down the stairs. I was so... Uh, I'll tell you, you know what? When I drank, you know... It, I was, I was getting worse and worse and worse. I was becoming a daily drinker and a daily drunk. And uh, my daughter, who my oldest daughter at the time, I says, I can't, I can't stand it. I says, I need to go to the hospital. 
So they took me over to the hospital, and I, you know, I never told anybody what was going on in my house. You know, you, you didn't say anything. Everything was fine in my house. So I went over there, and uh, I had been sick for a couple of days. I could hardly get down the stairs, and they took me over there. My husband was in New York still working, and uh, the doctor said, uh, you know, in the emergency room, what's wrong with you? And I says, well, you know, I either have a gallbladder attack or I have food poisoning. I don't know what I have. And he says, well, let me put you in the hospital. So they put me in Teaneck uh, Holy Name Hospital, and uh, he said he would put me on a, a liquid diet so they could do some tests. And, uh, I, well, I was in there for three days. Now, do you know what happens to an alcoholic who doesn't have anything like alcohol in their system for three days? Well, I can only tell you that I went into the DTs, into Holy Name Hospital, and there was a heart patient in the room. They had to move her out of the room. <laughs> I wanted to jump out the window. I saw those little rats and mice that are underneath the bed. The crucifix was on the wall. It came down like this. And uh, I was really scared. They had to strap me to the bed, and they had a nurse sit with me all night. And then the doctor came in the next day. He says, there's nothing wrong with your gallbladder. He says, you're nothing but an alcoholic. And I said, the heck I am. I always have these little hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> and I had. I had. And he says to me, I'm going to give you something that's going to be like a double martini. I says, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> And he gave me a shot of Thorazine. And I'm going to tell you, I did the Thorazine shuffle at Holy Name Hospital. And I says, don't you ever give me that again. That's nothing like any uh, martini that I ever had. And then he says to me, he says, you know what, you really need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I really didn't like this doctor because they talked down to women in those days. That was in 1975. And I says, well, okay, you know, I, I don't know if any of you, you're in treatment or you're in a hospital or anything like that. When they say, you know, you got to go to AA and you say, yeah, 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 I'll go to AA, I, you know, just to get them off your back. And uh, so I went out, I called Alcoholics Anonymous. I wouldn't tell them my name. And uh, I came back in and I said to them, I says, uh, yeah, I called. Uh, I called AA. I'm going to go to AA. And so I left that hospital. And, of course, you know, I, I've been very involved in bridging the gap in Alcoholics Anonymous because I know what it's like to fall through the cracks when you're leaving a facility and you don't go to AA, you know, for help. And uh, so um, I got out of there, and before you know it, I was, you know, had first a couple of beers, and it was some more beers. I know about a relapse before I ever came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Uh, then my husband came home, and he says that uh, we were moving to Florida, that he was being transferred. Now, I can only tell you that I really didn't care that much about New Jersey, but I had no desire to come to Florida. <laughs> but I had no other choice because I was dependent upon him. And so uh, we moved to Florida, and uh, we found a place in Coral Springs, and how we ever found the place, I have no idea. Because, you know, I was still drinking, he was still drinking. And uh, we thought, you know, that everything was going to be wonderful. That he was going to have, you know, someone do the lawn and the gardening and all of that. And I was going to have a maid when we got here. And we had, you know, just all these feelings of grandiosity when we got here. We brought the kids of course, a couple of them didn't like it because, you know, they were in high school and they didn't want to leave their friends. And you know how that is, all the conflict that was going on. And so um, we got here, and the problem was we brought ourselves with us. <laughs> and uh, we got to Coral Springs, and now I started drinking very, very heavily, and he was drinking heavily. And our lives were just uh, uh, falling apart. I can remember it was a Thanksgiving before I came into the program. Now my stove was broken. My washer was broken. The air conditioner was broken. 
everything was broken. We had no money. I always tell everybody I had bills and bags. And I can remember that I was lying on the bed. Now, I always prided myself in being good, a good housewife and mother. And as a matter of fact, to all the women, we did the best that we could do under the circumstances suffering from the disease of alcoholism. It was very hard to put out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and macaroni and cheese and take the kids to school and try to do all of those things. So don't be too hard on yourselves when you come in here. And I can remember that uh, it was a Thanksgiving day and I was in bed and I was really, really sick. And my husband, now this is funny, it's sad, but it's funny, but he was out on the grill with a big turkey trying to cook it on the grill. And I was so ashamed. I was so guilty. And it was so, so sad. And uh, we used to hide our bottles from one another. You know, I'd hide his bottle, I'd hide my bottle in the garage, and he'd hide his bottle under the bed. We had a hard time finding them. Uh, one day, and I had a lot of resentments. I had a rocking chair. I had a resentment rocking chair. And I would rock back and forth. I would rock back and forth. And I'm going to tell you, you know, when he went in the house, he didn't even know what hit him. Because he, he didn't realize that I had been thinking these things up all day long. You know, why didn't you take out the garbage, you know? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? So that was my resentment rocking chair. But uh, it just got so worse, I was getting sicker and sicker. And I says, oh, John, I says, you know, you've got, you got to find me a doctor. You've got to find me a doctor. So he got a phone book, and he got out the yellow pages, and he looked in there, and he found a doctor. And I was trying to taper myself off before I went to see him. And we went over to the doctor's, and we went in there. And the doctor took one look at me, and he says, go on in there. He says, I want to examine you. And he says to me, how much do you drink? And I says, oh, two beers. <laughs> and you know what? When I came into the program, you all told me that's what you told the doctor when you went to see them. We have the one thing, the two beers that we tell them. And he examined me. He told my husband he went into the other office, and he says, I believe your wife has cirrhosis of the liver. So I come in there and I see them, that their faces, you know, they're not looking too good. And, I, and he says, uh, I believe that you have cirrhosis of the liver. And I says, well, am I going to die? He says, you're not going to die. He says, if you stop drinking. And I thought, I'm going to die. Because <laughs> I can't stop drinking. And then that doctor, who my husband got out of the phone book, and his name, and I'll give you his last initial, it's Dr. U, and he told me he happened to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I knew from that time on, and I knew that I knew that I knew that there was a power greater than myself in my life. And then the doctor says to me, he says, uh, I want to put you in the hospital. And I says, well, you can't put me in the hospital right now because my little girl, Stephanie, is having her birthday, and it's on August the 7th, and I want to have a little party for her, and I had promised her that party. So he says, okay, he says, we'll put you in the hospital after the party. So that's another thing. I did the best that I could. I put out the ice cream and the little cupcakes, and she had her party, and I didn't drink all day, and... uh it was about five minutes to 12 after all the kids went home. My husband went to bed, and I sat on my resentment rocker, and I sat there, and I prayed to a power greater than myself, whom I choose to call God, and I says, Dear God, please help me, help me to put down the drink. And that was the night that I had my last drink, and I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink since that time. And he put me... And I owe, I owe that to my higher power and the God of my understanding. And he put me in the hospital. They put me in the hospital, and they did the, the biopsy on my liver. And I also have, was suffering from malnutrition. I only weighed 92 pounds. My stomach was out to here. My eyes were yellow. And uh, 
They did the biopsy, and sure enough, I had uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And he says to me, he says, do you want, and he belonged to the, he, he went to the Coral Springs group, mind you. And he says to me, he says, do you want two ladies from AA to come and see you? And I said, yes, I do. And two ladies from Alcoholics Anonymous took the time out of their day to come and see this old drunk in the old Margate Hospital. And one was named Mary, and one was named Ruth. And those are very symbolic names to me. And Mary kissed me on the cheek, and Ruth held my hand. And alcoholic mind that I have, I said, they sent me the nice ones. (laughs) And I always see that picture of the man on the bed, and I see myself in that picture with the two women by my side. And I can't thank you women enough in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous that that have helped me through my sobriety and through my recovery. They asked me if I wanted to go to a meeting, and I said, yes, I did. And while I was there, the woman in the room next to me, she says, what's the matter with you? And I told her, I says, I drink too much. And that's the first time I had ever disclosed that to anybody. And then the priest came in the room, and I did a confession, and I told him I was going to try to stay away from a drink. I had no idea what Alcoholics Anonymous was about, but they said, you know, you want to go to the meeting? And so the women came. The women came to my house. Now, the car was full. And I thought, well, why are all these women in this car? And I was, you know, kind of sick, and I was shaking. I was a shaker, boy, when I came in. And uh, I just scrooched myself into the car. And I thought, my gosh, I says, uh, after I came in, they said, you know, they must have found out that I was a hard case or something. (laughs) And I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and there were two speakers there. And I was able to identify with the speaker, and I had a quarter in my pocket, and I was able to put the quarter in the basket. And that made me feel really good because I had a lot of pride when I came in there because I didn't want to not have what, you know, to put something in there. It was like church or something. And and I went to my meeting, and uh, I'll tell you, I didn't know what you were all about. Uh, I, I thought you were all still drinking. I didn't know you could get sober, and uh, I can remember crying when I would go. I would cry, and uh, it was just, uh, it was a really big experience, you know, for a newcomer to come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and and I identify, you know, when the newcomer comes in, the feelings that you have when you come into the program, and uh, there was one guy, he told me later on, he says, Joyce, he says, you kept the whole group sober for a full year. <laughs> he says, because no one wanted to go out and look like you did when you came in. <laughs> and I can only tell you that I have shared with you my first and my second step. And, you know, I went to a lot of meetings, and I had a sponsor that had a hard time doing the third step. And uh, she would tell me to go to the meetings, raise your hand, tell them, do you want to talk about the third step? And so finally I was going to all these meetings, and I heard about the third step, the third step, because I really didn't want to turn my life and will over to the care of God as I understood him. And finally I was at my home group, and I had two old-timers there, and they were both the president of AA, and they said... <laughs> Cut out this intellectual nonsense. This is a spiritual program. And if you don't take that step, you're going to get drunk. And so I said, okay. And I made that decision. And what I understand that decision is today is did I want to go back to my old way or do I want to lead a spiritual life? And I knew that I wanted to never to go back to my old way and that I had made that decision to lead this spiritual life. Uh, I went to meetings, and I had the uh, good fortune of when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous of the Pompano Beach Workshop, where Wesley P. did the steps. And uh, we went through the book, and I went there religiously every week, and that's how I learned to put a spiritual uh, background into my life. They, I, I was very, very slow. I didn't know in the fourth step about Mr. Brown and Mrs. Smith and all of that stuff that's said in there. I knew I had a lot of fear and insecurity and low self-esteem. I was off the map 
when I came in there, but they just went one step at a time with me in the at the Pompano Beach workshop. So I was very fortunate, and I went to there for over a year and a half. As a matter of fact, I attended the first big book seminar here, and I can remember Wesley. Uh, I went to the uh, international convention in uh, New Orleans in 1980, and he had a big luncheon for Lois. And Lois, uh, I got to meet Lois, Bill's wife. And they had uh, like a raffle there. And they raffled off the big book tapes of Joe and Charlie's. And I won. And I was so excited. But he was giving out a lot of these tapes. And they says they knew, they knew they, the, the thing was fixed because I needed those tapes more than anybody else. <laughs> And uh, I finally, I did my fifth step after going through the workshop, and I, and I went up to West Palm Beach, and I, w I did my fifth step with a, with a priest there. And when I went in there, mind you, he opened up the closet, the, the closet door, and there was all these white handkerchiefs. And he pulled one out, and he says, this is a fifth step of handkerchief. And he gave me that handkerchief. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And I told him everything about me and everything that was in my fourth step. And he told me, Joyce, he says, when you leave here, you can go out and do whatever you would like to do. If it's God's will, you will have the strength to do it. And I walked out of my fifth step, a free woman. And I went home, and I took out the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, like it says, and it says, are all the steps in place? And I said, I believe so. And then I says, my creator, please take every one of my de uh, defects of character. And uh, I said the prayer. And then I went on and I took the eighth step and the ninth step. I made my amends to my family and to those around me that had been hurt. And I continue to take personal inventory and... Uh, I seek through uh, prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understand him, praying only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. And God has given me power in my life and the strength to go whatever I need to go through as we uh, trudge this road of happy destiny. And then I believe I have been spiritually awakened because I'm no longer the same person that I was when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I had the profound psychic change that Dr. Silkworth talks about in the, in, the, in the doctor's opinion. Every day that I was sober for two years and nine months, my husband was drunk. So if you have someone that's drinking in your family, I read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it says, you know, he had his... I was afraid to tell the old timers, you know, that he was drinking in the house because they wanted every all the alcohol out of the house. And... Um, so uh, he, he was drunk uh, every, every single day. I would go to my meetings. I got a job in a supermarket, and I went along my way, and he went along his way. As a matter of fact, he thought that he had lost his best friend when I came to AA. But after um, two years and nine months, after his losing three jobs, he came home. He was dev devastated, and he says, you know, uh, tell me, give me somebody's name, I guess i got to go to one of your damn meetings, he said. <laughs> and he came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, his uh, sobriety date was May 5th, 1980, and that was Cinco de Mayo. And uh, the little Spanish doctor that I went to, Dr. Yu, you know, my husband started 12-stepping people, but Dr. Yu couldn't stay sober. And they would pick him up from the Margate Club and take him home because he'd be so drunk. And they would stay with him all night long. And one night, uh, uh, his wife called, and he, Dr. Yu had died from an overdose of alcohol and drugs. And I said, you know, oh, my goodness, why did they take him and they didn't take me? And I, had, I don't have the answer for that. But Dr. Yu helped many, many people, and not only in the Hispanic community, but also in, uh, in, in just the general society. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And I always bring him up because he was my contact with Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, 
When John came into the program, I didn't know whether we were going to hit it off or not. You know, we're sober. But I guess what? We fell in love all over again. And I'll tell you what a joy and what a journey that was. He got very, very involved in service. Uh, he became your delegate. Um, I also became very involved in service. I had uh, gone to the University of Miami. I had uh, gotten uh, my certification uh, to help alcoholics and families uh, of alcoholics. Uh, I went up and I got my certification uh, up in uh, up in Tallahassee, and he was in service, and I was doing that, and I sent in my resume to the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they selected me to be appointed committee member of the Trustees Committee for Treatment Facilities for the United States and Canada from 1992 through 1996. So that was very, very special. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to embarrass him, but our Southeast Regional Trustee is here tonight, Howard, and I'm so glad that you are here with us this evening. I guess you want to know about the kids. My oldest daughter, guess what? Married an alcoholic. He just recently got a job, and we're all very, very happy. <laughs> He's tried Alcoholics Anonymous, but he's not ready yet. Uh, she has um, a daughter, my granddaughter, and a grandson, her son. My granddaughter, by her, is mentally disabled. My mentally disabled granddaughter gave me this little brace that my daughter brought it with her, and it uh, had the serenity prayer, and all the little beads beat the serenity prayer. So she understands what we're doing. My second daughter married an alcoholic, <laughs> and I can only tell you that she has raised her daughter uh, as a single mom, so I know what you single moms go through in raising children, and uh, she's here tonight, and uh, also her daughter's here tonight, and uh, my granddaughter has three months in Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> My third daughter. Now, that was something because John and I used to chase her to crack houses. And I don't recommend that you do that. I don't re recommend you do that. Anybody do that. But we did. We chased her all around Palm Beach County. I'll tell you that. And uh, what we were able to do is John and I took her to her first meeting of Narcotics Anonymous. And I want to let you know that last March she celebrated 22 years in our party. And my second daughter, she's a member of Al-Anon. As a matter of fact, she's the DR for Al-Anon here. So don't... Uh, so I never make jokes about Al-Anon. Al-Anon saved my daughter's life, and I don't ever say anything but praise for Narcotics Anonymous, because Narcotics Anonymous is saving my daughter's life and my granddaughter's life. And you know what? I owe that all to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because we gave them our 12 steps and our 12 traditions free of charge. <laughs> My last son, our last son, he's the bad apple in the family. <laughs> he hardly drinks or drugs or does anything. <laughs> in uh, 2002, my husband became very, very ill. He had emphysema. And... Uh, he had prostate cancer, and it was very, very sad because he had to leave service, but he said, you continue to stay in service, Joyce. And uh, I love the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, but because the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous are a set of sacrifices that we make for the good of AA and for the good of our families. And so um, 
my family, you know, made their sacrifices. They came over, my kids would come over and take him down to the clinical trial uh, for uh, cancer. Uh, they'd take him to the doctors. Um, we all came together to make sacrifices. I can remember one time I went to the quarterly and they came over and sat with him while I was, uh, was going to the quarterly. I would get up in the morning and I would bathe him and I would hold him and I would feed him and I would uh, take care of him. We used to pray on our knees every night before we went to bed. And uh, he would pray for who he was going to pray for, and I would pray for who I was going to pray for, my sponsees and, you know, my family members and all of that, until he could no longer get on his knees. And so he would sit on the end of the bed, and I would hold him, and we'd pray together, and he said, you think I'm going to go to heaven? I says, of course you're going to go to heaven. I says, there's no question about it. And one night... Uh, he said to me, he said, uh, I need to go to the hospital. And I didn't want him to go to the hospital because I knew if he went to the hospital, he was not going to come home. So I took him, called the ambulance, and we took him over to the hospital. And my daughter from New Jersey was able to come, and we were all around him. And we held his hand. And the doctor says to me, he says, I don't think he's going to last the night. And I says, well, could you move us to a private room? And so they moved us to a private room, and the room number was 449. <laughs> and we were all around him, and we said the serenity prayer, my whole family, the unit, and I owe all that to the traditions and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we prayed together, and he passed away that night. And I know he's in heaven, and I know he's happy, and he's joyous, and he's free. And we had a service for him, and I think everybody from South Florida area came, and his two sponsees gave the eulogy, and it was very, very moving. The women in the program really, really helped me. The men in the program, they supported me. I went to my meetings, I cried, uh, but I've been able to stand on my own two feet because you have given me the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life, and I try to work the 12 steps and 12 traditions to the best of my ability. And I want to let you know that I told you in the beginning of my story that I was always looking for a vision. And guess what? I found that vision in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a whole chapter. <laughs> a vision for you. And if I haven't said anything tonight that might help you, this might. Ask in your morning meditation what you can do for the man that is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you can't transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great things will come to pass for you and countless others that is the great fact for us, and thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.